Good afternoon. I'm Jessica Kardashian, and I'd like to welcome you to this one-hour webinar co-hosted by the National Urban League and the Learning Policy Institute. I want to let audience members know that this webinar is open to the public and is being recorded. The recording will be emailed to you in a few days and available at the link just shared in the chat. We'd also like to remind viewers that this is the second in a series, and the previous webinar, Making S's Equity Promise Real, can be viewed at this link. Please sign up for our mailing list to receive a notification or check our website's upcoming events page for future webinars. Today's agenda will begin with a presentation by Danny Espinoza. We'll then hear from Rigel uh, Massaro and then Roy Jones, followed by a moderated discussion. And finally, we'll have some time to respond to questions we've received from the audience. We encourage you to submit your questions through the presentation in the chat box at the lower right of your screen. Please make sure all participants are selected from the drop-down menu to ensure that we see your questions. I will now turn the webinar over to Danny Espinoza, a research and policy assistant with the Learning Policy Institute and the lead author of Taking the Long View, State Efforts to Solve Teacher Shortages by Strengthening the, Strengthening the Profession. Danny? Thank you, Jessica. Uh, my name is Danny Espinoza, and at the Learning Policy Institute, we're focused on bringing high-quality research to communities and policymakers in order to improve education policy and practice, and ultimately improve learning opportunities for children. A major focus of LPI's work over the past few years has been studying teacher shortages. Today, I'll talk about strategies for solving teacher shortages in underserved communities. In particular, we'll discuss why teacher shortages matter, what causes teacher shortages, and what states, districts, and schools can do to address their teacher shortages. As many of you may be experiencing in your communities, and as we've seen in headlines across the country, many states, districts, and schools are facing teacher shortages. Our research shows that schools across the country were short at least 100,000 qualified teachers last year. Almost every state is experiencing shortages in certain subjects. Shortages are particularly severe in special education, where 48 states in D.C. have reported shortages, followed by math and science. And depending on state demographics, more than 30 states also reported shortages in bilingual and English learner education. Here are a number of reasons why the shortage of fully qualified teachers matters. In addition to challenges with sustaining and building on school improvement efforts, opportunities for students can be limited as a result of teacher shortages. When districts have a hard time filling vacancies, they may cancel courses, increase class sizes, staff classes with long-term substitutes, or hire underprepared teachers, all of which impact student learning. In addition, it becomes challenging to develop student-teacher relationships or to provide multiple pathways that prepare students for college and career. And one of the consequences of shortages is an increase in the percentage of uncertified teachers, which has a disproportionate impact on schools serving predominantly students of color. The most recent data by the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights Data Collection shows that between 2014 and 2016, the proportion of uncertified teachers grew by nearly 50%. Furthermore, schools with high minority student enrollment are nearly four times as likely to employ uncertified teachers compared with low minority schools. That is a cause for concern because not only are teachers without full preparation generally worse for student outcomes, they also only act as a Band-Aid solution. Research indicates these teachers leave at two to three times the rates of fully prepared teachers, creating the leaky bucket phenomenon that further contributes to shortages. It's important to note that shortages are often a teacher turnover issue rather than a pipeline into the profession issue. Teacher turnover is especially high in schools predominantly serving students of color. The top two bars of this graph show that turnover rates for teachers overall are 70% higher in schools with more students of color than in schools with few students of color. And the turnover rates in those schools are even higher for math, science, special education, and teachers who enter the field through an alternative certification pathway. It's important for states, districts, and schools to know why teachers are leaving. Based on our analysis of the Department of Education's nationally representative schools and staffing survey, most teachers surveyed stated that dissatisfaction of some sort was a very or extremely important reason for why they left teaching. That includes dissatisfaction with testing and accountability measures, or dissatisfaction with the administration and with poor working conditions. And in addition to having a stable teacher workforce, many schools and districts recognize the benefits of having a diverse workforce. Research findings show that all students benefit from a racially diverse teacher workforce. Teachers of color can boost academic performance, attendance rates, and school climate. They may also improve satisfaction and decrease turnover for other teachers of color. However, we found that in addition to some of the issues for why teachers leave that I discussed on the last slide, there are some conditions that are unique to teachers of color. For example, teachers of color tend to work in under-resourced schools, which are also schools that serve the most students of color. 
teachers of color are also twice as likely to enter teaching through an alternative certification pathway, which is associated with having high turnover rates. However, it's important to note that when we compare turnover rates for teachers of color and white teachers in the same kinds of schools, their turnover rates are essentially the same. In other words, teachers of color aren't more inclined to turnover. They're just more likely to teach in high turnover schools where turnover rates are high for all teachers. Improving the conditions in those schools is important for supporting their retention, but can also, of course, improve the learning conditions for students. How can states and districts productively address their teacher shortages? A recent report by LPI highlights six strategies states and districts can use to address their shortages, shown here, but without undermining, under, without undermining teacher quality or lowering certification requirements. In the interest of time, I'll only be covering the first couple of strategies. However, they are all included in the report, which I encourage you to check out on our website. The first, teacher residency. Teacher residencies are a model of teacher preparation that recruits candidates to work with paid apprentices, apprentices to skilled expert teachers for a full year while completing highly integrated coursework. Residents typically receive financial support in exchange for the promise to teach between three to five years. The model also involves a tight partnership between the university and district so that training is grounded in the district context and meets the hiring needs of the district. Research on teacher residencies shows that graduates of these programs tend to have higher retention rates than their peers, are effective teachers, and increase the diversity of the local teacher workforce. Another effective strategy are Grow Your Own programs, which focus on recruiting members of the community who reflect the local diversity and are more likely to continue teaching in the community they already call home. They include a variety of approaches, such as two plus two programs that allow candidates to begin teacher preparation at a community college with clear course articulation agreements to then complete teacher preparation and credentialing requirements at a four-year institution. Grow Your Own programs have shown positive results in recruiting and retaining diverse teachers in the hardest to staff schools. A review of a national program found participants remained in teaching longer than the typical beginning teacher and taught in high need urban and rural schools at a very high rate. Our report highlights how a number of states are providing increased opportunities for residencies and Grow Your Own programs. A similar map along with state examples are included for each of the six strategies in the report. Uh, for example, in the past couple of years, California has invested $45 million to revive a classified staff teacher training program, a type of grow own program that is currently serving over 2,000 candidates and is offering up to $20,000 per candidate to help pay for the cost of teacher preparation. Another strategy to address teacher shortages is loan forgiveness and service scholarships at the federal and state level. These are particularly important for recruiting and retaining teachers of color who are often burdened with significant student loan debt in addition to often receiving low salaries. Regarding low salaries, U.S. teachers make about 20% less than other college graduates, and that amount grows to 30% by mid-career. In fact, in more than 30 states, a mid-career teacher heading a family of four is eligible for government assistance. Our report highlights how a number of states are providing increased salaries, loan forgiveness, or service scholarships of significant amounts to teacher candidates. For example, Nevada recently launched the Teach Nevada Scholarship, which offers a $24,000 scholarship for individuals to help fund their teacher preparation in exchange for teaching in high-need subjects or schools for five years. I wanted to conclude with one final thought, which is that while addressing teacher shortages requires significant investment, the cost of not making this investment is even greater. In addition to the cost in terms of student achievement and school accountability, which are significant in and of themselves, turnover carries real financial costs between $4,000 per teacher in a rural district and more than $20,000 in an urban district. So high turnover in an urban district can cost districts millions of dollars in recruiting, onboarding, HR, and other training costs. To assess the cost and savings in your district, LPI provides this calculator on our website. I'll close by encouraging you to visit our website where we have a series of research reports, briefs, and interactive tools that go in depth on some of the points I've made here and how states and districts can move these efforts forward. Thank you. I'll pass it back to you, Jessica. Great. Thank you, Danny. And just a reminder to our audience members that links to all these reports are being posted in the chat box and we'll follow up with them as well. And as Danny mentioned, he mentioned uh, two of the six strategies. The report uh, showing up on your screen now provides more on, on all of the different strategies as well as state examples and efforts in this area. I am also uh, would like to remind you to include uh, in the chat box any questions that you have for panelists and we'll try to get to as many, as many of them as possible after the presentation. We will now hear from Rigel, a senior staff attorney with the Public Advocates Education Equity Team, where she focuses on teacher quality and school finance. 
Rigel is a former teacher and a lifelong activist. Rigel, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, again, my name is Rigel Massaro. I'm a senior, senior staff attorney with Public Advocates. Public Advocates is a civil rights law firm and policy shop in Northern California. We do education, equity, housing, transit, and climate justice work using a community partnership model to inform our policy advocacy and impact litigation. We also rely on experts like Danny to inform our advocacy. Uh, I am a former middle school teacher in Arizona. I was an intern with Teach for America. I'm familiar, so, with the underprepared and alternative certification experience. I'm going to talk briefly about teacher shortages in California and how public advocates has approached advocacy to combat shortages at the state and local level. So the picture, um, this is this is pulled from the LPI report, from an LPI report. The picture in California is is as dire as the rest of the nation, where the blue line represents our estimated teacher hires, and the reddish orangish line there represents the new credentials that are being issued by uh, by the state. And so there's a big gap there. And how are we filling that gap? We're filling that gap with substandard permits and credentials. They are on the rise in California at a pretty rapid rate. And for us, this is a civil rights issue because these underprepared teachers tend to be, uh, are more likely to be teaching high need students, students of color, low income students. Public advocates vision for our teacher quality work is that all students are taught by fully credentialed teachers. Uh, even when we're not facing a shortage, this vision is hard to realize. And so until we do, we want our credential and experienced teachers to be equitably distributed so the hardship doesn't, doesn't fall unduly on high need students. So in times of shortage, we advocate and litigate at the state and local level for data to understand the areas and impacts of shortage. If we don't have this, it's hard to advocate for sound policy. We advocate for keeping the teachers we have and state and local policies to support uh, keeping teachers that are in classrooms currently. We resist efforts to water down standards and support a robust and diverse teacher pipeline. I'm going to take each of these points in turn. So in terms of leveraging data, I'm mentioning two pieces here that are applicable nationwide. We continually lift, lift up data on teacher pipeline through the Title II annual reports on teacher prep programs to show, for example, that while California teacher diversity has been increasing, it's not near reflecting our students' diversity. Uh, or we might point out that we are preparing a disproportionate number of teachers via alternative certification, which could be evidence that our state needs to further support candidates to pursue traditional credentials, for instance, through loan forgiveness, as Danny mentioned. Um, tied to the Every Student Succeeds Act, we're pushing for school level data to be part of local conversations about the disproportionate number of ineffective and inexperienced teachers teaching at our state's low income and, uh, and high, um, high poverty school. In California, we're, we're supporting efforts to improve teacher data. We have a long way to go to have great data on our teachers. Um, I'm flagging this, this slide for a couple reasons. Uh, well, first of all, this is a graph showing how many credentialed teachers are teaching in a subject or students they're not prepared to teach. In California, we call these misassignments. So, uh, for, so two points. One is you can see that this shortage hits high need stu students, such as special education students there in red, the hardest. And we know black students and English learners are disproportionately represented in special education, which is further illustration of how this shortage is, is a civil rights issue. Uh, secondly, this data is only collected every four years. You see here it's 2011 to 2015. For our state to have a complete picture of misassignments in every school, we only get the data every four years. So we're working on obtaining yearly teacher data on misassignments, vacancies, underprepared teachers at the state, district, and school site level. I'm going to talk next about two local examples of the work we're doing with community partners. Um, in Richmond, 
uh, or West Contra Costa Unified, which covers Richmond, California. Last year, analyzing their, their financial planning, we noticed the district plan to double its investment in teacher professional development using funds generated by high need students. Now that, that can be a great thing, right? We know that when teachers feel well supported and well equipped to meet their students' needs, they're more likely to stay. However, we knew the district's numbers, they're highlighted in green, that retention numbers were actually dwindling over the past few years according to the district's own data. And this increase, this, this doubling of investment was coming without any explanation um, of how we were going to be um, ensuring that these dollars benefit high need students. So we wanted to make sure the district was gonna spend this money wisely in a way that ensured teachers felt supported and, and supported um, robust instruction. And so through advocacy with the district and the county office, we were able to ensure the district articulated a plan to make these dollars meet the needs of high need students at their school site level for school site professional development. Uh, also just wanted to point out, we see the, the percentage of underprepared teachers increasing every year in this district. And in Oakland, another example of where we're partnership, partnering with community-based organizations, I'm gonna talk about the retention issues there. Um, Oakland suffers from very high teacher turnover, 18.5% attrition. In partnership with youth-led Californians for Justice and family-led Oakland community organizations, we've prioritized teacher retention and diverse teachers in partnership with the district. Um, CFJ's focus comes from their young people's understanding that relationship-centered schools aren't possible without a stable and culturally responsive teaching force. And through this partnership with the district, we're using these stay factors and leave factors that we've gleaned from surveys um, to create a plan, a five-year plan uh, for recruitment and retention in the district. I just wanna flag that there've been some links added here to the chat box. If you wanna learn more about Oakland's um, very robust data dashboards around educators, um, Californians for Justice and Oakland community organizations. So jumping up again to the state level, as I mentioned earlier, part of our advocacy in times of shortage is resisting efforts to water down standards. Um, these it, it, shortages bring the right conditions for the arguments around watering down standards. And these changes should be made with extreme caution because lowering standards can impact uh, the long-term quality of the teaching force and particularly for high need students. So we've resisted multiple bill, uh, legislative and regulatory proposals to water down standards until they're proven absolutely necessary. And even then we advocate for as robust preparation and support as possible. In this instance, um, the, our teacher shortage has brought a substitute shortage, which has led to um, rolling subs, particularly in special education classrooms. So we were able to ensure the problem was documented before policy change, and we won 40 hours of local preparation before these permit holders with no teaching, um, teaching experience or education could be the teacher of record, as well as weekly mentoring. And finally, we wanna address the, the, the pipeline, right? So this is uh, aligned with another of the suggestions um, that Danny, Danny brought forth. Um, for years, we've been advocating for the state to take uh, a bold, take bold action regarding teacher shortages and uh, address this crisis. A crisis that's affecting everyone locally is not something that locals can solve. And so this year we got a total, won a total package of $130 million to address teacher shortages. Um, 75 million for teacher residencies in special education, uh, science and math, 50 million for districts to be creative about how they attract and retain special education teachers, and 5 million for professional development um, for prospective and credentialed bilingual teachers. And we're in the process now in partnership with LPI to make sure that these funds are, are implemented and, and, and do the job that, they, that we expect them to do in terms of addressing our pipeline. Um, 
we're kind of out of time, but I'll, you know, we do we do touch on litigation when it's needed, and particularly ensuring that um, the underprepared teachers are as prepared as we can we can get them to be. Um, and happy to talk more with folks offline about that. Um, thank you very much, and I'll pass it back to Jessica. Great, thank you, Rigel. And we are definitely thinking of you out in California. We know it's been a, a difficult week. Uh, we are going to head over to Rigel, uh, sorry, over to Roy in South Carolina. But first, want to just remind participants again to please submit questions in the chat box. We have a number of questions already that we've received, and we'll make sure to get to as many of them as possible after we hear from Dr. Roy Jones, who is a professor and the executive director for the College of Education's Call Me Mr. program at Clemson University. Uh, Roy will talk uh, more about the program, but the mission of the Call Me Mr. program initiative is to increase the pool of avail available teachers from a broader, more diverse background, particularly among the lowest performing elementary schools. And we are going to learn more about that program and its uh, impact. Roy, I will turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Jessica, and, and uh, thank you again for um, allowing me to be part of this important conversation along with uh, Rigel and Daniel. Um, yes, I am. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity and um, to get right into the conversation. I will give you a. Uh, you, you certainly expressed uh, well the mission of the Call Me Mister program. I um, want to point out at the outset that um, the program um, began in this, uh, at Clemson University in partnership with three private uh, historically black colleges in South Carolina. Uh, the development began actually 20 years ago um, to address uh, teacher shortage, uh, but specific to uh, teacher shortage to African American men um, teaching at the elementary school level in, uh, in South Carolina. Um, this first visual is a um, um, actual photo shot of uh, one of our ceremonies uh, celebrating the graduation and completion of um, uh, our, our misters um, during one of those that, that time. MISTER stands for Mentors Instructing Students Toward Effective Role Models. Uh, and this is the this, this, this statement that you referred to at the uh, introduction. Uh, it has been our mission for since 2000 when it, we first launched. So we were in development in the late 90s. Uh, recognizing that fewer than 1% of our state teacher force um, were, were African-American men teaching at the elementary early childhood level uh, at that time, fewer than 1%. And um, we developed this mission, um, which has been the same since we launched in 2000, 18 years ago. Um, this was the statistics back in 2000. There were over 600 elementary schools. Um, served by over 20,000 teachers, um, and there were a few. There were 200 African American men teaching in those schools. Um, in, in effect, um, less than one percent, one percent of the teacher force were black men. Yet, black children were being suspended, expelled, and referred for discipline in in high rates um, within our school system. Um, and I don't want to lead you to think that the 200 was spread in 200 schools. They were highly concentrated, so we estimated that there were at least 75% of our schools in South Carolina that didn't have a single black male teacher uh, teaching at the elementary school level. Uh, since 2004, when uh, we first started graduating misters that entered our in in 2000, um, from 2004 up until literally last spring, um, we have graduated um, 220 one fully certified, as Raju would point out, fully credentialed um, black males that have gone through teacher education programs, traditional teacher education prep programs, and um, completed with a fully certified um, a degree and, and cert a certificate to teach at the elementary level. Uh, we currently have uh, about 229, uh, well currently it's actually 100 and um, 75 misters that are currently enrolled in our in our program at all levels, from um, bachelors, um, mainly bachelors, and a few masters candidates. And our partnership has grown from Clemson and the three HBCUs to now 
24 collaborating institutions in South Carolina alone. Um, this is a listing of uh, all of our partner colleges uh, and to really <laughs> uh, stress the phenomenal growth uh, is that although we started with um, the HBCUs, the private HBCUs in partnership and collaboration with Clemson, the success of those institutions uh, and then later on adding uh, South Carolina State was the fourth HBCU. We currently have all of the HBCUs, which are four, that are fully credited in uh, South Carolina as partners with Call Me Mister uh, and Clemson. But, it, but the success caught on, um, and it has always been our position that if the model is followed, um, that the same success experienced at the HBCUs could be experienced at the PWIs and HWC, um, uh, historically uh, WCUs, white institutions and universities in South Carolina. And here you have a listing of those. I won't name them all, but you can recognize some from the College of Charleston to uh, which is a state-supported institution, to the Newberry Colleges, which is a private um, a white liberal arts institution, faith-based institutions uh, like Southern Wesleyan. So we, we cover the waterfront in terms of the profile of collaborating colleges, and uh, all have been uh, successful in uh, recruiting and retaining um, cohorts of, of uh, African-American males. In addition, uh, you see um, as well the network of uh, two-year colleges, because we recognize early that uh, in a state that has, um, uh, and I'll cover this momentarily later, that ranks um, 50th um, in education. Uh, and we've gone back and forth between 48 and 50. I'm not sure what the difference really is. But um, in a state that has basically performed at the bottom in education on most measures, um, that you know, no, there's no surprise that many of our students come out of their K-12 experience not fully prepared to, prepared to enter into a college, um, traditional college setting um, and do well, and regardless of whether you're a teacher or not. But when you add in uh, the stress of being um, a challenge of being a teacher education major, uh, pursuing teaching with all of the requisite tests required, that uh, many of our students are simply not uh, prepared to um, take on a, a competitive um, uh, college and university at the outset as a freshman. So we in, in employed, if you will, and in, in, um, uh, included as part of the collaboration our two-year technical colleges in South Carolina are known as technical colleges, community colleges, junior colleges known in else, elsewhere, but in our state as technical colleges that have filled the, the bill for many of our students that need to start um, and develop um, their basic skills, even on the college level, before transitioning into a teacher education major. So that's been very successful um, with us as well for that, in terms of that collaboration. Um, our success, success has also caught on nationally, where we began to get inquiries starting in 2005, 2007, from other states that said, hey, we're experiencing teacher shortages along the same lines, same um, experiences that our black students are having. Um, what did you do and how can you um, expand to, um, can you, are you prepared to expand into our, uh, our state? And uh, we didn't know how to do that initially and didn't think about it because we thought we were the only ones in the country with this problem and we were trying to solve our problems within our state. Well, fast forward now 18 years, we have uh, now grown into nine states, um, including institutions in all those states, um, making uh, to about 31, 33 institutions totally in the Call Me Mr. Network. And as again, you see it varies from southern colleges, um, southern states to midwestern states, um, as well as um, Virginia's uh, as well using the same exact model that we use in South Carolina. Our conceptual framework um, in brief is, is uh, what you see here is that we are, and, and, and stress this, our students are uh, major in traditional teacher education prep programs. But we know that that is not enough. Um, we knew early on that that's not enough. We had to create and did create a co-curricular framework around these, you know, these students to engage in their development. And so, the co so this model, conceptual model, involves the co-curricular 
um, uh, experience of a mister throughout their matriculation uh, that leads to not only their recruitment, but their development and retention. So in here, and I can't go into much detail, but it, it involves community engagement, it involves summer experiences, summer internship, it involves uh, summer leadership institutes, um, and, it, import, and importantly, a uh, residential component that requires them to be involved in a living learning community. And we were among the first um, living learning LLCs in Clemson University um, uh, as an example, as well as the LLCs in the other colleges. Um, but at the core of all this is the co-curricular experience that students have. And uh, these are just a uh, shot of some of those experiences and, uh, that um, uh, uh, our students are exposed to throughout their matriculation. Uh, now, this is, um, this is critical in terms of the system that um, we've developed that has been remarkably successful, that uh, we've introduced um, basically a triad partnership uh, that encompasses and, and it's been mentioned as one of the strategies, and we represent a GYO, a grow your own model from the very start. Our whole position, our whole philosophy is that the teachers that um, were going to be successful in Call Me Mr. and that we were targeting um, were, um, in fact, in South Carolina, in the communities that we expect them to come from and expect them to go back and teach in once they finish. So we, we, again, look to not other states and even internationally, uh, where many districts have had to, leave, they have to go uh, outside the country to find uh, talent or outside the state uh, particularly, um, we felt the talent existed right in our own communities. And by cultivating, identifying and cultivating that talent through our experience, that we could develop a, a, a lifelong career teacher. Um, but it also involves this triad experience where you uh, are modeled that involves the two, you know, the, the school district, which are the producers of the students that are the eventual benefactors of the process, uh, as well as our two and four year colleges that are engaged in the system as well. And we've been, been involved with that now for a solid um, uh, 12 years involving the, the three triads. Growing your own experience is just another table to show the flow uh, of growing your own um, and also to engage um, uh, Sierra Center for Recruitment and Retention in South Carolina where they have pro team and teacher cadet because we believe the mindset that the development, the, the, the gem, the germ, and the seed is planted early in students uh, uh, to become teachers. And we try to drill down to try as, as, as far deep as we can go, began to identify students early on that could be potentially um, a, a, a teacher um, through, our, through our system. Um, not very much like um, the philosophy of athletics, where they literally assign stars uh, to students, to, to potential student athletes early on in terms of how they might fare later on in, 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 um, in collegiate, collegiate acti uh, athletics. Well, the same as a teacher. How do you de identify a master teacher? They don't start off as a master teacher. They have to start off with the dispositions, attitudes, um, preparation, and skills to develop into what becomes a master teacher. We believe in the same uh, process involves uh, uh, students wanting to become a pre-service teacher. Happened to this slide. Uh, oh yeah, the the need um, a diverse teacher workforce benefits all students, but especially low income students, of color. Context in 2018, the South Carolina education system ranked 48th of 50 with high inequality and growing teacher shortages in our whole state. So it's a state challenge for us. Challenge in South Carolina, the demographic shows that the representation of uh, diverse educators through teacher, through recruitment and retention. Our white student, uh, students represent 51%, um, 1.1% uh, of uh, the student population, but also represent 78%, 0.6% of the teachers. 
black student population in South Carolina ranks uh, is 34%, uh, with teachers just 15.3%. Latinx uh, students represent 9%, with just 1.6% of the teacher workforce. Um, due to the success of Call Me Mister over the last 18 years, um, the State of South Carolina, through the Commission on Higher Education, uh, issued a RFP um, for uh, a um, center of excellence, which has been a program they've had over 20 years. Uh, it's highly competitive. Every state college and university in, in, in South Carolina can compete for a uh, and, and submit uh, proposals for a center of excellence. Uh, well, we submitted one last last fall. And uh, we were able to prevail and issued a um, and granted a center of excellence for South Carolina at um, at Clemson University. Our center of excellence is known as the Center of Excellence in the Recruitment and Retention of Diverse Educators. The goal you see here is to research, design, and implement the best strategies for recruiting and retaining high quality diverse educators. Um, the, we produced a book entitled The Call Me Mister, The Reemergence of African American Male Teachers in South Carolina, uh, recognizing the uh, evolution of um, the education of black kids in our state. Um, you're looking at a basically a two-room uh, schoolhouse back, uh, dated back in the early 1900s um, that is still standing today. Um, being uh, in front of them, we have three remarkable young men who started off as freshmen and have become uh, teachers, um, and all of them from South Carolina, um, and they've done remarkable well, uh, remarkably well coming out of this, uh, this, this state and under the conditions even to this day. Basically, at the, uh, the end of the proposal, the uh, presentation, uh, just to again stress that um, we are partnered uh, and our misters come through uh, teacher education programs. I want to end with this stat, though, that among the misters that have graduated, 95% of our misters are still in the classroom that have graduated since 2004. The other 5% are either principals or assistant principals or, or working in a, um, and still working in education in some capacity. Uh, and, um, and, and also 90% of our misters are still in South Carolina uh, as well. Uh, a mister must teach in, in giving back in service for every year that they receive uh, support from Call Me Mister. Um, there hasn't been a single mister that has failed to, um, um, give, to honor that commitment, and uh, we're very proud of that. Uh, so that's, um, uh, that's our strategy. That's our, our dedication to South Carolina and also beyond South Carolina as we have expanded into other parts of the country. Great. Well, thank you so much, Roy, and just for sharing all that and for your important work and the great impact that it's having. As Danny mentioned early on, a lot of the teacher shortage issue is about retention. So hearing the retention rates for uh, program graduates is really impressive. Also, would like to just let audience members know that we have uh, included a link to a report that LPI produced that speaks to the benefits of a diverse educator workforce and the research base behind it that Roy had mentioned. And with that, I'd like to take about 15 minutes and try and get through as many audience questions as we, um, as we can. Um, we did receive a number of questions around rural education. And uh, Danny, if you want to start us off, what strategies are being used to address teacher shortages in rural areas? And then Roy, I know you spoke a bit about the work that you're doing um, and in a diversity of states, but including southern states, so if you might want to speak to that after. So, Danny, will you start us off, please? Happy to. Thanks, Jessica. Um, so there's a range of different strategies that um, school districts in rural areas have been using to address their shortages. Um, I'll highlight a few. Um, so two plus two programs that I mentioned in my report is um, one, one model that can be used. In, the reason is why, I mean, not surprising that for many rural districts, um, a university or a credentialing institution isn't nearby. Um, so the graduates, um, the, the, the supply of, of graduates is um, hard to access and tap into. So um, two plus two programs where you have a, a credentialing um, institution partner with a community college um, is a, a successful model. So we saw um, actually 
was recently speaking with um, faculty at uh, Elizabeth City State University. It's a, a college in North Carolina, and they partner with um, community colleges in Halifax County um, over 100 plus miles away um, to uh, prepare and credential teachers for, for that community and to help them address their shortages. Um, it involves everything from um, beaming into classrooms or beaming in for sessions, but also you know, driving those miles, making that commute to, to be on the ground to, to, for classes, for mentoring, coaching, observations, all of that. Um, some other examples um, in Colorado, they have a Colorado Center for Rural Education. Um, and one of the ways that they're helping to um, increase the number of teachers that are considering rural um, education position or teaching in rural communities um, is even offering just a stipend for uh, individuals to um, student teach in rural schools. Um, uh, Roy mentioned earlier about SARA in South Carolina, the Center for um, Educator Recruitment and Retention. Um, they also offer um, salary stipends for teachers that teach in high turnover districts, which in South Carolina is um, frequently rural um, school districts, um, and they also offer loan forgiveness. So there's a few models there. Uh, teacher residencies, I think, are another that we've seen. Um, in California, there's the Kern Rural Teacher Residency, there's the Chico Teacher Residency, um, and in Colorado, again, there's a, a Bocher Teacher Residency that's focused in, uh, or has a, a branch that's focused on um, rural school districts. Great, thank you. And Roy, are there any um, aspects of the Call Me Mr. program that are specifically unique to, to supporting schools in rural communities? Absolutely. Um, Danny just mentioned one. We have a strong partnership with Sierra um, and where they have added um, incentives for teachers teaching in rural districts uh, in, in partnership with the state. So there's a recognition on a, on a large scale within our state um, that rural uh, retaining teachers in rural areas is very important. Beyond that, um, because we, we, our whole state is rural, uh, for the most part, with the exception of a few townships, um, our larger cities, obviously Columbia, Greenville, Charleston. But um, frankly, um, we're we're deficient um, in in these rural areas. So what we've done, especially with the the center um, uh, initiative, is that we go in and we talk and kind of do an assessment and try to get a needs assessment of what's going on in these communities. Um, and that's not always obvious, uh, and, but specifically, how does it impact the loss of talent within those communities that would otherwise um, uh, be beneficial to them for, as teachers? And that often happens. So part of the stress is to, uh, what, we've, what we've stressed, is to identify early on teachers that come out of those same communities that we can work with um, and, and uh, as along the pipeline uh, with some degree of expe expectation that they will return to those districts to, uh, to teach. So we're beginning to add and find um, uh, for incentivizing that. Uh, we can certainly do that, call me mister, but um, beyond that, um, we, we think we can um, develop the kind of resources um, involving stakeholders that can help provide those same kind of incentives, contribute con incentives to uh, entice and keep the talent that comes out of these communities um, to return to these communities. Now, our tech system is important because there's a tech ecology system with the main campus or an outreach campus that really is within reasonable proximity of most of our students in the state. Uh, now, getting to a four-year college is different, but at least, you know, if, you, if we can get that pipeline started at the tech system level, then we can um, facil facilitate into a teacher ed program at a four-year college level. So we're working on several levels, but really the main one is to, again, identify talent early, make teaching an attractive um, vocation um, to go into with, with benefits that are reinforced uh, every year that they're in school and during summers. Um, we think that's the strategy, and if we've got a formal relationship between the school district, the colleges, the community, faith-based community, uh, community organizations, businesses, civic organizations, then we, um, we've begun to really have impact on that and show that education is everybody's business. Great, now that's really helpful, and I, I also starting 
early on, uh, at the federal level, they just passed uh, fairly recently the Career and Technical Education Act, and a number of schools are considering developing a teaching pathway as one of their, their pathway programs. North Carolina, there's a, a rural district that includes uh, education as one of their uh, pathways in high school. So I want to get to a question around ESSA implementation that came through, and then a preview where we're going to talk a little bit about how to fund some of these efforts, because a number of participants asked about that. But Rigel, uh, as a number of states are planning to implement their ESSA plans and focus on school improvement and closing gaps for historically underserved students, including, as you mentioned, English learners and students with disability, disabilities and students of color. What is the impact of teacher shortages of high turnover rates, particularly on local and school efforts to implement ESSA and improve school performance and close gaps? Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, so teacher shortages are uh, a real barrier. They present um, significant challenges to school improvement efforts. Um, Underprepared teachers, particularly those serving high needs students, are, are likely to be consumed by day-to-day -day teaching survival, uh, like I was as a brand new and underprepared teacher, um, and have limited capacity to reflect, plan, collaborate, refine their practice, look at data. Um, they're also less likely to be kind of long-term at their school site with their students and their district, and, and they might know that um, or, or they might not, but when, when they're less likely to be long-term invested, again, that's, that's a real challenge to, um, to turn around efforts at the school site and at the district. Um, th so, so, you know, you really need folks who are around, who know the students, the programs, the conditions of the community, um, and, and and, and when you have teacher shortage and you've got folks kind of coming in a lot of teacher churn and underprepared folks, that, per, that poses a real barrier. It, it really um, can, frankly, halt improvement efforts at a school site where there's an overwhelming reliance on underprepared teachers. Right, and we're also hearing, uh, in addition to that, that a number of secondary schools are trying to increase opportunities for advanced placement, dual enrollment, early college, CT pathways, but if they don't have the educator workforce to do that, it can be particularly challenging. Uh, it is worth mentioning that districts and schools can use funding under uh, ESSA to implement staff surveys, so at least to get some sense from, from teachers about, around school climate and how they're experiencing their working conditions, which I would imagine would be very useful information for school improvement efforts. We also received a number of questions around what federal programs could support state and local efforts in this work. Uh, Danny, would you like to share a little bit uh, um, about what resources might be available from um, federal funding? Sure, happy to. Um, so there's a range of, of different possibilities that, of federal funding sources that can be used to address teacher shortages. Um, I mentioned a little bit about ESSA and Title II funding for licensure requirements, residencies, mentoring. Um, or even school leadership under Title II, 3% set aside. Um, so all of those um, are you know, flexible sources to use um, for school, for states and then schools and districts to use for uh, address their teacher shortages. There's also um, under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, um, Part B, there's funding there to support special education teacher shortages, which are a major issue um, and often um, overlooked. Um, Within the Higher Education Act, um, many people might be familiar with teacher quality partnership grants, um, but those can be used to fund residencies. Uh, and then, of course, Jessica, like you mentioned too, the, the Perkins um, CT Education Act is another source for both uh, funds to support teacher, CTE teacher recruitment um, and support. Great, so and we're hopeful, right, and we're hopeful at LPI that uh, in this new Congress, they take up reauthorization of the Higher Education Act there's a number of opportunities to better support these programs. So uh, TEACH grants, which support uh, teachers who work in, in high needs fields and schools, uh, increasing the TEACH grant award amounts uh, would go a long way in offsetting some of the low salaries that teachers might make so that they're not, as you mentioned earlier, burdened with high student uh, debt loads. Uh, there are a number of programs uh, under the Higher Education Act that support uh, historically black colleges and universities and other MSIs. And uh, it's a really small pot of funding. Hopefully, there'll be an increase in funding. But they support teacher and leader prep programs at uh, HBCUs and MSIs. 
And uh, again, we're, we're hoping that in this new Congress, they'll take this opportunity to strengthen these programs and increase federal investment. Um, we have time for about one more question. And one of the other ones um, that came up uh, from a number of participants was the extent to which cultural proficiency or culturally responsive practice is being incorporated into teacher preparation and in the work being done um, with teachers already in the school. So maybe, Roy, if you want to start us off, and then Rigel will talk a little bit about the work that you're doing in that area, that would be great. Sure. I'll try to do it quickly with the nine time. But yeah, much of it really has to do with exposure. You know, part of development, and we do this in, again, the co-curriculum outside of the formal you know, curriculum where we help students uh, teacher candidates understand uh, the need to connect with their, their, their students um, once they get into the field, but we do it as pre-service teachers. So we expose them to communities, to families, to parents, to understand the context that students come from. Um, the, and, and in many of that context, some of that context is their own, but at the same time, um, uh, not all kin folks are skin folks, not all skin folks are kin folks. That culture is multiple. Just because you share the same uh, skin hue um, doesn't mean that you come from the same subcultures. So part of it is understanding that what is and how do you connect with, with students to, to get students to actually respond uh, to commit to their own learning. And a lot of that, we do that through an exposure upon exposure upon exposure throughout their matriculation as pre-service teachers. We don't wait until the end of the program, the teacher ed program, to do it within uh, uh, student teaching, for example, or even their uh, uh, preclinicals. So a lot of it is just, you know, understanding their own story. You know, every mister has to be able to articulate their own story throughout their matriculation so that they can appreciate and respect the lives and stories of others. Uh, and in a nutshell, that's what it is, but it's, it's really a, a, a much more developed um, development process that we get into in terms of disposition and attitude and, and uh, to help our students stick and stay. We're not trying to just put them out for a year and quit or to fulfill an obligation and quit. We really are looking for really uh, strong educators. Uh, yeah, so this is Rigel. Um, I agree so much with what Roy has shared and, and just want to lift up that, um, you know, having culturally responsive education is critical for addressing student achievement gaps. Um, in districts where we work um, with organizations like Californians for Justice, who has a campaign around relationship-centered schools, in some of these districts, it's one in five high school students feels like there's an adult at school that cares about them. Um, and care comes from knowing, and knowing comes from taking a time, the time to, to build a relationship and, and understand um, who students are. Um, and so this is data we, we, we think is critical to collect and lift up and integrate into teacher preparation and professional development. Um, and it, because, it's, it, again, it's just critical to closing those gaps and making students want to come to school, feel welcome at school. And, and for teachers as well, there's been some really interesting research that, you know, teacher retention is, is more positive when teachers feel connected. And you saw in the data around Oakland that they feel more, they're, they're more likely to stay when they feel connected to students and families in the communities that they're teaching in. Great. No, thank you. Um, and we, you know, received another question around how we can um, raise the prestige of the profession. And I think, obviously, raising teacher salaries is uh, an important piece of that, as well as making sure that we're making the right investments in their preparation and their support once they're in the classroom. So unfortunately, we've run out of time, but I would like to thank you, Danny, Rigel, and Roy, not only for a great discussion and presentation, but uh, more importantly, for the wonderful work that you are all doing each and every day. I'd like to thank our partners, the National Urban League, in putting this series together, um, who are also doing really important work each and every day. I'd like to remind the audience that we are recording this webinar and we'll email you in a few days when it's available. And another quick reminder that the previous webinar is posted right now, and if you'd like information on upcoming webinars, we invite you to sign up for our mailing list to receive a notification. 
Also, the following online resources, including slides from today's webinar, are posted on the webinar's page. And finally, we'd like to let you know that a survey will appear in your web browser when this webinar ends. It'll take just a few moments and to, to complete, and if you have time, we'd really love to get your feedback on possible future webinars that we can do in the series and also ways that we can improve the webinars that we deliver. So thank you all for your time on this busy Tuesday, and have a great rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you.